Mitchell's hideout was only three miles from his family home, but phoning, let alone visiting, was out of the question. Mitchell wanted to see Ronnie, but he too was hiding from the police and chose to stay away. Watched all the news, all the programs, everything. For the first, I should think about four or five days, it was all Mitchell. Bang, 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 Mitchell. Troops looking for him. And even the cartoons are about. I think Giles did one. Then that slowed down. Everything seemed to slow down. It wasn't too long before he started getting fed up. It was just one prison for another one. He was expecting the twins to be all over him. And he thought he was going to go to all these nightclubs and pubs and be the star. But that didn't happen. So he was gradually this ate into him. We had told Reggie that he kept asking for him. And uh, he was worried because nobody had been to see him. So Reggie said, oh, but it was all very casual. I don't, think, I don't think Reggie had any great liking for him, not, not to the, as much as Ronnie. No. He, he was Ronnie's baby, if you like. It wasn't, wasn't Reggie's cup of tea at all. But Reggie showed up just to keep things sort of quiet, you know. Then that wore off. So the next thing was we get him a girl. This is Lisa. The, the girl that was actually kidnapped by Reggie Cray and uh, another member of the gang from Winston's nightclub where she was working as a hostess and taken it immediately to that flat that we saw the picture of where Mitchell was waiting and she was there to satisfy his sexual needs. She was a, a woman that could uh, engage you in, in uh, any kind of conversation. Uh, she's got an incredible repertoire. She and Frank Mitchell formed some kind of bond in the very short time that they were together. Lisa, meet Mad Axman. And they just stood there. She was a little bit shocked and because uh, she couldn't miss the news the last few days. Uh, he was just grinning, you know. This is mine, isn't it? Christmas. And uh, that was it. I shut the door, left them in the room on their own. According to her, he was quite a stud, you know. And um, but he used to like her watching his workouts. Trying to impress her, I don't know, I don't know but um, nobody could look at her for too long, sort of thing. That was his woman, that was it. Me tells her new Jane, sort of thing. She complained a couple of times that she wanted to go. And they said, now you're here now, you've got to wait until he goes. Uh, then, then she was escorted home to get some change of clothes and brought back. And uh, that was it. She was, she was a prisoner as well, really. She couldn't go out or anything like that. Unless she'd be accompanied, though. Know. What would have happened if Frank Mitchell had not liked her? I, I, I don't, I don't really know. I think possibly once she knew where he was and that, she'd have had to go swimming in a fatal accident in the Thames or something like that. Mitchell's prison file contains a Christmas card from Teddy Smith, one of the men who drove him off the moor. It was meant to make the police think he knew nothing about the escape. On day six of Mitchell's freedom, the Crays ordered Smith to the flat to help draft Mitchell's letters to the newspapers, asking for a date of release. It was like a mother talking to a five-year-old, getting ready to go to school, you know. Uh, and I didn't like them, it was stuff like that. It was all childish, you know. And so I'll get out as quick as possible, once he's quietened down. Yeah. Mitchell's letters to the newspapers made it clear his escape was a protest and that he was willing to give himself up if he got a release date. But no politician was going to bargain with an escaped criminal. It was politically impossible. Sir, 
my absence from Dartmoor was to bring to notice my unhappy plight. To be truthful, I'm asking for a possible date of release. From the age of nine, I've not been completely free. Sir, I ask you, where is the fairness of this? His pleas fell on deaf ears, and his father appealed on television for Frank to give himself up. Mr. Mitchell, have you got anything to say to Frank? Any message for him? Well, all I have is, all I, all I say is, it's your old part, Dad, Frank. And I'd like to see you get a definite date and give you a short up so you can go back and finish whatever it is and come out of you. And so I want to see you. And I want to see you at home, you Sam Mitchell's appeal meant nothing to the craze. Two days later, Frank was executed on their orders. In part three, his killer talks for the first time. In the cramped flat where Mitchell was hiding, it was increasingly obvious that the craze plot was unraveling and nerves were frayed. It would have all been a bit crazy. The atmosphere of the flat, you know. One guy sitting there sucking a bottle of whiskey and taking pills, and the other two sort of mooching about, bored out of their skull, and the other one doing press-ups. It would have been a weird old situation. Lisa least such that he could blow up at any minute, but, uh, I don't know, maybe a job prepared, a, she could handle a guy, you know, she knew how to calm him right down, keep him happy. With as much sex as he could. Yeah, but, uh, I say the man was a bull, he didn't quiet him down as much as he thought, and, uh, then he started threatening to visit the mother's address, Balance Road, because they'd been writing to him. So he knew where they were. This is a knife that uh, Frank Mitchell actually made whilst he was serving his sentence in Dartmoor. It was made in the prison. And this, together with a mask and uh, his, the rest of his prison clothes, was found at the roadside by the police a couple of days later. Over a week into the manhunt, the police had found Mitchell's clothes, but still had no leads as to his whereabouts. As the hunt continued, Mitchell's minders were growing increasingly worried about his state of mind. One of them, Scott Jack Dixon, was alarmed to discover that Mitchell had got hold of another weapon. Scott Jack woke up one night, and he's standing over him with a big kitchen knife. And he said, tell the twins, if they don't get round here, I'll come round there that he reported this to the twins. So now Reggie squirts off and reports it to Ronnie. And that was it. The Crays now had a problem. They wanted to make disappear. There was only one man in London capable of providing the service they needed, Freddie Foreman. Foreman's criminal pedigree was every bit as strong as the Crays, but in a different department. He was a thief, not a gangster a careful plotter of bank raids and armed robberies. He led a close-knit group of hardcore villains with a reputation for extreme violence. Rumour said even murder. Foreman was from South London, not the East End, but he knew the craze well. Throughout the 60s, they had been secret partners in crime, each supporting the other's reputation. The craze wanted Foreman to do something about Mitchell. The escape was running out of control and the craze felt threatened. The problem was written all over their faces.